There are a lot of ways to tell the story of the development of modern science. Um, I tend to start with the Greeks because it's the story that I know the best, but scientific thought today, you know, including medicine and engineering, also has roots in the Arabian Peninsula as well as in the Far East, particularly China. But I'm going to tell the story mainly of how this developed in Europe. One thing that you should understand, I think, at the beginning is that people have always noticed the natural world, have always been curious about the natural world, had always wanted to have explanations for it, sometimes for the purposes of like medicine, but others just because the natural world was a source of interest. Now, early on, the classic approach to this was that the study of nature was a part of philosophy, you know, that we would call um, natural philosophy rather than this kind of rationalist approach that we take today. I would start off thinking about, I mean, you can start any place, but I'll start with Aristotle because that's like a good set point to start off with. When Aristotle studied the natural world, he saw this he saw the living things as gradations from one unchangeable form to the next in the natural world. His assumption was that all species were going to be immutable, which means that they can neither create, be created nor vanish. This is an extension of the essentialist argument that Plato used. Basically, the idea that each species has its own type. You know, there are there's a some essential type of living thing that makes it a sea star or that makes it a bunny rabbit or that makes it a an earthworm and that essential nature was unique to it and it separated it from all other kinds of species so the thing you got to remember about aristotle is he was like an old geometer so every kind like, like you know like every triangle like scratched in the soil around a campfire was only an approximation, an approximation of like a perfect triangle, you know, and just like geometric shapes have their own essential natures, he extended to that to the living things that they all had their essential natures as well. Now, because there is this gradation from simple to complex, it ended up um, being understood later. Now, this is into the 1700s as what's called um, his Scala Naturi or also called the great chain of being. And on the right, you can see this list of elements at the bottom going up through plants into animals and then eventually humans near the near the top of creation. Basically, the idea that there is a ladder like set of relationships that connects these living things. And because species are immutable, you like don't change their rung. So this was a foundational idea in the West for thinking about living things that withstood for hundreds of years. Aristotle thought of the world as being infinitely old and like would exist for all time. He was what we call a catastrophist. Life on Earth was created spontaneously and also destroyed repeatedly um, through history. And in some cases, fossils were thought of as either minerals or sort of vestiges of these previous worlds. And basically it was you know, they'd be kind of regenerated from nothing um, after each catastrophe. Now, I see this as sort of the set point for how the West thought about the relationships of living things. We talk about higher animals or lower animals, um, at least colloquially, that's the way biologists talked into, you know, well into the, into the 20th century. But so basically these early attempts to kind of codify the Scalinaturi started to get taken up as a task for biologists. So here in the 1700s, we see the work of Carl von Linné, who was a Swedish botanist who developed a taxonomy of living things. Linnaeus is, and his name is always like Latinized to Linnaeus from Linné. Linnaeus was trying to like codify the Scalinaturi by looking at characteristics of living things so what he did was he would base his groups on characteristics, like anatomical characteristics, that today we would call homologies. Look here at these cartoons of the four limbs of five kinds of mammals. So we have a human arm, um, that's a mole, then a horse, then a dolphin, then a bat. Now, what the colors represent are the different bones. 
of the forearm. So in yellow is the humerus, then the radius and ulnar together. And then you got a whole bunch of those little green carpal bones, then the metacarpals that make up the palm, and then the phalanges, the digits at the end. Why do you think these limbs look different from one another? If you're like most people, you would probably say they look different from one another because they do different jobs. You know, the human arm is for grasping things. If you look at the mole arm, it's got like that extra big green um, bone there in the wrist. That's actually one of his wrist bones. It's kind of like grown into a thumb because basically it's it, it's not an, a real anatomical thumb, but it's basically it's making itself a bigger shovel so that it can dig. And if you look at the ulna, the, the bone that's in um, blue, it's got a really pointy end like so when you like strike the the point of your elbow that's a point called the olecranon what that does is it's going to increase the mechanical advantage for the triceps which is helpful for when you're digging horses they only have one digit they only have, they're actually horses are running on their middle fingers all the time so in that case in the case of a running animal like a horse they've they're trying to optimize for speed so they're reducing the number of digits and um and making these bones like a lot sturdier than the individual fingers would be. In the case of the dolphin, it's building a paddle. And of course, in the case of the bat, it, those long, long fingers are there for supporting the wing membrane. The green bones look like they're all one bone. It's multiple bones that they're just not cartooned in. Now, here's the thing to get from this. When Linnaeus was looking at different kinds of living things, he was compare, He was trying to compare like apples to apples. I mean, he was a botanist. So on this cartoon here, the yellow bones or the pink bones, they all represent what do we call homologous structures, structures that have like a shared developmental, shared evolutionary history. So when we're comparing the shapes of these different things, we know that we're making comparisons for like the same patches of cells during, um, during embryonic development. So the big thing that I want you to get about Linnaeus is that, first of all, when he was looking at different kinds of living things and trying to arrange them, he used homologies, uh, these structural similarities, as the clues to show how it is we can talk about their relatedness. But the thing that turned out is he actually didn't find this, this kind of ladder-like set of relationships between living things. Instead, what he saw was there was more, it was more like a bush where some kinds of living things appear to be more closely related than others. So we find his taxonomic categories that he ended up generating were sort of like these nested hierarchies where there are, there, you can talk about big categories like animals or smaller categories like mammals or even small and ca smaller categories like families or genera or species. But there was more. With the development of technologies during the age of reason scientists were able to understand what was happening at the very small scale of bodies now um robert hook who was an early microscopist as well as um, anton von leeuwenhoek these early glass workers were people who developed the first some of the first microscopes and like but the first cell was identified by hook in about 1665 so the what he found was, and what von Leeuwenhoek found, was that wherever they looked, the living things were composed up of cells. So what we have here is like this structural unity where all living things are made up of at least one cell or maybe multiple cells or, or billions of cells if we're talking about um, very large animals. So one piece of information that got brought in here was um, we see the structural unity that underlies all living things. But it wasn't just the technologies like the microscope that helped, but people also started to try to understand better what caused the surface processes on the earth. I'm kind of skipping ahead a little bit here to talk about Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell is a geologist. He published during his lifetime this really influential um, three-volume set called Principles of Geology that talked about what you probably would have learned about in the past as like the rock cycle. But there are a couple things that, I, that in particular that I want to um, make sure that you're aware of. Um, so, first of all, this is obviously a picture of the Grand Canyon. What carved the Grand Canyon? If you've been there before, or if you just know the story, what carved it was the Colorado River. Now, if we're looking at these rocks, where are the oldest rocks when we're looking at this, um, like say like the, you know, either side of the riverbed, the side that you, they say on the right side of the screen where you can see all those rock layers, where are the oldest rocks? 
Now, the answer here is that the oldest rocks are down at the bottom of the stack because when they were first laid down, these are what are called sedimentary rocks for the most part. These sedimentary rocks would have been laid down in a flat layer and then the next rock, and then like the ocean that would have been, that was present over North America at this time would have laid down the next layer on top of it, then the next one. This is a rule called superposition. I think of this as like the pancake rule, where if you're making a pot, you're making a bunch of pancakes, you make the first pancake, you put it on a plate, make the second pancake, put it on top of the first pancake. So eventually the stack that you develop, the youngest pancake is going to be up at the top. Now, um, of course, there had to be all these solid layers there first in order for the Colorado, Colorado River to have something to erode down through. So the thing that I want you to get from this is that this, what he took from this is basically this would have taken a lot of time to happen. Just going back here, one of the ideas that Lyle developed was this idea called uniformitarianism. The idea that we don't live at any special place or time in the universe. The, the rules that you see, um, you know, the way the volcanoes work today or the way the rivers work today, the way the glaciers move today, we figure it probably, our, the basic assumption in geology is we assume that things happened in the past the same way they happened today. Geologists always say that the present is the key to the past. So uniformitarianism is the idea that we can observe modern geologic processes and then try to interpret the rock record, assuming that, that, was, that they would have formed by the same processes that we can observe today. So this is kind of an extension of this uh, principle that Copernicus had come up. You know, we don't live at some like special time or place. As a result of this kind of thinking, we weren't stuck with like a single catastrophic like Noachian flood to explain all ge geologic formations in the whole world. What we have is evidence of a much older earth than what would have been expected if you were to say take like the the story in the pentateuch in the early part of the bible uh, the early part of the christian bible as being um, a history of what the of what the earth would have been like so we have a few pieces of information here we have an old earth before that we have that all living things seem to be made out of cells before that when we compare characteristics of living things, we can arrange them um, from like more to less similar, but not necessarily from like simpler to more complex. Now, the thing is, these rocks have fossils in them too. Now, there was the, probably the father of comparative anatomy, if not paleontology, was a, was a Frenchman named Georges Cuvier. Cuvier um, worked in Paris at the um, Natural History Museum. And what he did there is he studied um, the, the layers of the Paris Basin. So that rock section that's shown here in French is um, represents the, layer, the layering of the rocks if you kind of go out and see how the strata are laid out. And you find at different layers, low down, you find evidence of fish, fish that are similar to ones that are maybe around but not present in the Paris Basin today. But also you find evidence of like rhinoceroses or mastodons, you know, mastodon teeth. Um, so you find them, you find lots of different kinds of animals that represent that life in this area in the past was different than it was today. This realization life in the past was different than it was today is what we call the fact of evolution the idea that you know living things have changed over time so this fact goes against this kind of aristotelian idea of all living things are you know kind of all all, all occurring together and you know made they're all going to kind of rise and fall together particularly because we have more information about like the biology of these animals and the kind of structural unity that we can, um, that we see represented in their, in their bodies when we look at cells. The interesting thing was that um, even though he dug up like hippos and elephants in the Paris basin, um, he didn't think, you know, Cuvier himself didn't think that this was evidence of, of change, of, of mutability of species. He saw that these looked like they're, they're just evidence of like past creations and extinctions. So he didn't believe that there, that there was any like real transmutation, only extinctions followed by new creations. But enough had happened in study of fossils as well as study of the you know, studies of the very small of the body where we have a whole bunch of facts that like kind of need explaining i want to just take a minute to have you think a little bit about 
like some terminology. These are all words that are pretty common words that you probably encountered before. You probably learned like the scientific method before, but take a minute to think about which of these terms is like the has the most explanatory power. Pause the video for a sec if you need to. Now, we can propose different ways of these be arranged, but let me explain the way that these are used by scientists. So at the very bottom is we have facts, facts that are things that we can observe in the world. And those we, we want to be able to explain those facts. We use hypotheses to try to explain a fact. Good hypotheses explain more about facts than less good hypotheses. Scientists will always prefer the hypotheses that are, have more generalizability about them. In fact, the hypotheses, when hypotheses grow up, they don't turn into laws. When hypotheses grow up, they turn into theories. So theories are the, is the term that we use for the explanations in biology that have the greatest explanatory power. Now, everybody expects like laws to be the one that's up at the top, but really the way that a law is used is we use laws to talk about phenomena that happen like the same way every time. You know, you might have heard, of course, we think of the law of gravity. But the law of gravity is an explanation for how gravity works. It basically says when you drop something, it's going to accelerate toward the ground at a certain rate of speed, like all the time. The theory of gravitation is explains why gravity happens but the law of gravity is just merely this like repeatable phenomenon that we see whenever anything falls where i want to go with this in the next video is to talk about early attempts to develop hypotheses and then theories about how living things would have changed over time. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about Darwin and beating up his ideas, but his ideas weren't the earliest ones to try to explain these facts on the ground.